down to verse 38 as we continue our uh, considerations of back to the basics. And really what we said is we're going to kind of retitle it a little bit and call it uh, not so much uh, just, uh, uh, back to the basics, but the disciplines of the Christian life and kind of a refresher course in the basics. And so Psalm 119 and verse 36 it goes like this. It says, incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity and quicken thou me in thy way. Establish thy word unto thy servant who is devoted to thy fear. We'll just stop there. I find it very interesting you read those verses. He, he recognizes that he needs God's help to somehow incline his heart towards the word of God because he realizes it's easy to get distracted. And so he talks about some of the things that can distract us from the word of God. One of them is covetousness. It's filling our lives with things, with stuff. And so he says, Lord, I want to be caught up with you, with your word, not with stuff. And then he says, turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity, from looking at worthless things. Well, listen, if ever there's been a day where it's easy to look at worthless things, there's hundreds of channels on television full of worthless things. There's, there's YouTube channels by the gazillion full of useless things, right? It's so easy for us to be completely distracted from the word of God by pursuing covetousness, by looking at vanity, worthless things. And then he, he says, quicken thou me in the way. And the idea is this, that he recognizes that if he's going to be revived in the ways of God, it has to be through the word of God. That's what God is going to use. And he recognizes that he needs quickening in the way that uh, uh, he needs constantly being revived in his own heart and establish your word to your servant who is devoted to your fear. Just lovely thoughts. But again, uh, just uh, this session, we want to think about a refresher course in the basics. We want to think about the word of God. And so <clears throat> as we consider the word of God, we, we, we said that our key verses for this session we're going to read them every session. First Timothy chapter four. Let's just go there again. It's this idea of disciplining yourself towards godliness. And just this idea of the, the, the discipline of the Christian life. Uh, we said yesterday, it is a devotional life. It's a love relationship with a living person. We said that, that uh, it's a dependent life. We're dependent on our indwelling heavenly guest, the Holy Spirit, to enable us to live this life but it's also a disciplined life. And so he says in verse 7 of 1 Timothy 4, he says, refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise discipline. Uh, the word is literally gymnasium. Uh, go to the gym yourself towards godliness. And the, and the idea is this, that, that just as uh, anybody who's a successful athlete has to be disciplined, if you're going to be a successful Christian, you also need to be disciplined. You will never drift into a successful Christian life. It's not going to happen. There's got to be a bit of discipline in your life. And so Paul often likens a Christian life in different ways. He talks about it like athletics, he, like he's running to win. He's running the race. He, uh, he, he said, we're all in the race, but, but not everybody wins the prize. And I'm running to win the prize. I'm in it. Uh, Mike Fitbit keeps saying, if I have a good day, it says, you're in it to win it. <laughs> well, let me tell you this. The amazing thing is the Apostle Paul was in it to win it. He wanted to win the prize so he could cast it at the feet of the Savior. And so are we in it to win it? That's a good question. Are we? Do we see that we're in this Christian life and that it really is like an athletic event? There are things to refuse. There are things to be disciplined about. And, and so we want to think about the discipline of uh, a, a relationship with the word of God. And then another picture that Paul often uses is, is the idea of a soldier. As well as being likened to athletes, scripture likens the child of God to be soldiers. We talked about praying last night, and it's like 
wrestling and, and, and it's like being in a conflict. Uh, what great conflict he said that he had uh, of, for the saints. And, and so it, it is a war. We're in a spiritual warfare. And we're soldiers. Second Timothy 2, notice this. He, he Again, giving some lovely pictures of what the Christian life is. And, and he says um, in verse 3 of 2 Timothy 3, he said, uh, 2 Timothy 2, verse 3, Thou therefore... Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And so we're soldiers. And if we're going to be a soldier, you've heard this saying before, I'm sure. Important part of the military is making sure the soldiers are fed. Have you ever heard the saying, an army marches on its stomach? Maybe that's just a British saying, but it's a... But the idea is this, that, that if the soldiers are hungry, they don't have the energy needed to fight. Right? They've got to be. And, and so the, the aspect of the military of feeding, I can imagine feeding these men, you know, in enemy territory. Uh, this is really important task uh, to be a military cook, so to speak. And, and so as soldiers, we've been drafted. The day we were saved, we've been drafted into the Lord's army. And just as prayer is a vital ingredient in the Christian life, even so the word of God is vital because it is our food. It's our spiritual food. Not only, by the way, does an athlete as well as a soldier need food, they need good food, right? Good food, like a, a, an athlete who feeds on junk food all the time is not, unless he's a sumo wrestler, He's not really going to be a good athlete, really, is it? If all he does is go to McDonald's and get fries and milkshake, um, it's going to affect him and his ability to run well. And so, again, we need good food. And there's no better food for the child of God than the word of God. And so it's important that we have an understanding of, of the vital ingredient of our spiritual food. So as, one, as we think about this, I want you just to look with me at 1 Peter. I want to talk about the importance of the word of God in the life of the child of God. And so we, we think about the beginning. We, we said last night that our Christian life, in a sense, begins when we call on the name of the Lord. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's, there's a prayer dimension at the beginning of the Christian life, but there's also a word of God dimension at the beginning of the Christian life. And so first Timothy, uh, first Peter 1 verse 23 says this, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So he tells us, how does this new birth, this miracle that makes us a child of God. We used to be, as it were, children of the devil. We used to be followers after the, the adversary. And now this massive transformation has taken place. And we're now new creatures in Christ. We're born again. We're children. of How did that happen? Well, he says it happened uh, just like, in a sense, any kind of bringing in of new life. New life comes when, when seed finds a receptive environment. Uh, we were up with some preppers in Norway who live up in the mountains, and uh, she grows vegetables, and, and uh, uh, she does it. She's she got heirloom vegetables and all the rest of it, and, and what she does, she, she plows up the ground, and then she sows seed, and when that seed uh, falls in the ground and, and dies, interestingly enough, and then all of a sudden, these lovely lush vegetation starts to arise. It's a miracle, like life comes out of death. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? And so when the word of God comes into our hearts in our first moment of believing, those that gladly receive this word, right? When we first receive that seed, that incorruptible seed of the word of God, in our hearts, an amazing miracle occurs called the new birth. And we get literally changed overnight. It's amazing. But once that's happened, this new birth, when, when a baby is born, for instance, one of the ways you know that baby is healthy is its appetite. Right? You have a baby, 
and it's newly born and it doesn't have an appetite for its mother's milk, it tells you one of two things about that child. It's either sick or it's dead, right? It, that, that's all it can be. Normal response when a baby's born, one of the first things is a cry. Why is it crying? He wants its mother's milk. It's got an appetite immediately. And he talks about this in verse, uh, in verse 2 of chapter 2 of First Peter. He says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. One of the reasons a person knows that he's truly saved is he has an appetite for the word of God. And what we could say is that if a person doesn't have an appetite to the word of God, either they're not saved, they, 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 they've made a false profession, they're not the real deal, or they're spiritually sick. Now, that spiritual sickness can come in lots of ways. Um, my wife was, was uh, a zealot for getting vegetables into our children. And she, she really believed, she, she don't like doctors, and she figured the best way to keep our children away from the medical profession and their predatory white coats, and she didn't like them at all, is if she can feed them healthy food. So she would zealously give them carrots. She'd say things like, you ever see a bunny rabbit wearing glasses? You know, this is, you know, you got it, you got to eat your veggies. And so my kids were raised on veggies. And by the way, they all love veggies to this very hour, which is a good thing. But part of the thinking was this, that um, uh, good food is healthy. It does produce spiritual health and vitality. And so as newborn babes desire that sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. And of course, growth comes through responding. And so when, a, when a, somebody doesn't have an appetite, and going back to our children, that's why I got sidetracked there, uh, one of the things that would always disappoint my wife is that she'd do a delicious meal, and sometimes the kids would come and they won't want to eat. And the reason that they didn't want to eat is they'd been around playing with friends, and they'd been eating junk food all afternoon. And it ruined their appetite for the healthy fare that had been presented to them. And if you would spend hours watching TV, it will affect your appetite for the word of God. Because you've been feeding on junk food. And sadly, many of God's people spend hours feeding on junk food and a few minutes reading the word of God. And it's producing a very unhealthy church. And so, again, we've got to think about these things, uh, the importance of the word of God. And so faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So initial faith, but ongoing faith is, again, by the word of God. Uh, it really does have a, a great impact. The Lord Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. And so that's the way we should, should be. And uh, one of my favorite verses is in the book of Job. And will, some of you have heard me say this before, but it's worth repeating. Job 23, 12. He says, neither have I gone back from the commandments of his lips. And then he says this amazing statement. I have esteemed, I have valued the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Isn't that quite a statement? And I, I like to put it this way. So in the morning, you have a choice. You have your sausage muffin with egg or your quiet time, but you can't, you don't have time for both. What are you going to go for? The word of God or the sausage muffin with egg? And Job says, there ain't no contest in my life. Given the option of the two, I would every time choose the word of God over my necessary food. I value, he says, the words of your mouth. Now, by the way, do we realize that? That when, we, when we're talking about the word of God, the Bible, 
What we're talking about is actually the words of his mouth. This is God's word to man. This is his love letter to the human race. This is a God communicating with his creatures, with his creation, and, and bearing his heart, revealing himself to us. This is an amazing thing. This is the word of God. What a blessing it is to have it. And so Job says, this is, uh, there's no contest as far as I'm concerned. The word of God will always come first. Uh, and I think it, we have to ask ourselves, where are our priorities? Now, he says, going back to 1 Peter 2, 2, he says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And what he's saying is that, that that intensity of desire that a new babe has for its mother's milk, the child of God should have that same intense desire for the sincere milk of the word. And as a result of it, growth will come. Uh, the baby gets all its nutrients, all the rest of it needed for growth. We get what we need for growth from the word of God. And so we, we need to retain that voracious appetite for the word of God. Now, it talks about the milk of the word. Now, when you look at Hebrews chapter 5, because one of the things that, that there should obviously be progress. You know, you don't feed a baby um, a filet mignon. Uh, it would not be able to digest it, right? So uh, the baby needs baby food. But if that baby is now 20 years of age and it's still drinking out of the bottle, you know, kind of bottle of baby milk formula, you say, that child is sick, right? It should have progressed from formula to steak. No vegetarianism here or veganism, like the Bible says we can eat meat and we should eat meat. So we just want to say that right now, uh, get it out there. But uh, so I just want you to see this Hebrews 5 and verse 10. It says, uh, called of God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say. This is Hebrews 5.11, many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing Ye are dull of hearing, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even to those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. So the Darby's translation says, who, instead of by reason of use, or who on account of habit have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And so what he's saying is this, that there's, a, there's an appropriate time to be a milk drinker, but there comes a time you've got to progress from milk and get onto meat. And sadly, the Christians that he's writing to have regressed and they've gone back on the bottle and he wants to talk to them about deeper things, but they're just not there. They're, they're a bunch of babies spiritually, even though they've been saved long enough that they ought to be teachers, but they're still babes. I think it would be true to say that there are many American Christians, some of them have been saved years and they're still spiritual babies. They've never really grown up. And it's, it's not a pretty thing. <laughs> it, it's horrendous to be a spiritual baby after being saved for years and years and years. And by the way, how, what, what is strong meat? Well, he, he talks about Melchizedek. And so can we just suggest that typology is some of the deeper meat of the word of God that Paul wanted them to get. He wanted to understand it. He wanted to talk about Melchizedek as a beautiful type of the Lord Jesus, but he said, you're not able for it. You still need the baby food. And so, again, we've got to ask ourselves personally, are we growing in not just our appetite for the word of God, but our ability to progress from baby food to uh, strong meat, 
that which belongs to the mature, that that belongs to those that are of full age, so to speak. And so we need to ask ourselves these questions. And how do we get from baby food to meat? How do we make that progress? Well, that's where our topic comes in, the idea of discipline. So I want to talk about some of the disciplines that will move you on spiritually in your relationship with the word of God. It's food. Now, of course, we, we eat frequently, don't we? Real food. I mean, this weekend, uh, dear Catherine has put all kinds of food in my apartment, but I'm getting so many invitations to go to eat with people. I'm not sure I'm going to get to eat any of it, right? And, and Christians love to eat. We, we just, oh, how good when Christians eat. I mean, meat. But when we meet, we eat, right? We are, we're, we're people that like to eat. But spiritually, if we need to eat frequently, spiritually, we need to eat frequently, don't we? And, and we certainly need to have a systematic daily reading of the word of God. What has been traditionally known as the quiet time. And why we say quiet time is that we're, we're shutting off all the distractions of the world and we're getting along with God and we're, we're communing with God. And that communion with God process, we said last night, we speak to him in prayer. He speaks to us through the word of God. But in order to communicate with you, to, you have to take time, right? Communication takes time. When my wife and I were getting to know each other, we used to go hiking uh, in the Yorkshire Dales in the north of England, and we'd spend a whole Saturday together, and we, we spent the whole time talking. Uh, when my son was dating Greta in Norway, they'd be on Zoom, and every night they'd be on for hours. Well, it wasn't Zoom, it was, I guess, whatever, FaceTime or whatever it was, and they were on for hours, and I'd say to my son, didn't you talk to her yesterday? Like, what's, what's happened since yesterday? Why do you have to be on again for hours? Well, he's in love with this girl. He wants to spend time with her. Well, how about it when it comes to the Lord Jesus? How much do we love him? Do we want to spend time in communion with him? Telling him how much we love him, how much we appreciate him, and then allowing him to speak to us through the word of God. And so this daily systematic quiet time, reading of the word of God, uh, allowing him to speak to us, getting this place of quiet. And why is it so essential? It's so essential because uh, we, Romans chapter 12, just turn there for a moment, Romans 12, we often talk about Romans 12, presenting your body a living sacrifice, but I want you to notice chapter 12, verse 2, it says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. First thing the Lord says is, give me your body. And so if we've ever done that, if there's ever been a time in our lives where we have literally presented our bodies as a living sacrifice, based on the mercies of God, right? So there's been that moment of consecration. He said, okay, now you have given me your body. I want your mind so that your body will be acting based on right thinking. So the very next verse, he says, be not conformed to what will be transformed by renewing your mind. How do you renew your mind? Well, you renew your mind by being in the word of God, you see. Because, we see, we're constantly bombarded in this world with corrupt philosophies and ideas. Every single day, we're, we're exposed to it. I mean, unless you become a monk and go, you know, and even then, you've got your own false ideas on top of it, but you're constantly bombarded. The world is, wants to bombard you with its philosophies, constantly. We, I was at, um, went to an aquarium with the grandkids in Norway, a very pleasant aquarium, and, and uh, anyway, went to see the penguins, and they were talking about they were feeding the penguins, and of course, this lady gives this lecture about uh, global warming and how this species was endangered, and it's all man's fault. And you know, it's uh, and you know, we we're just we're the dirty criminal rascals that are causing all this chaos on planet Earth. You know, and and I'm thinking to myself, you can't even go to the zoo without being bombarded by philosophical ideas that are contrary to the word of God. 
You can't even just go take your kids, your grandkids to the zoo. Like we're bombarded. And how do we stay sane in the midst of all this? You constantly have to come back and renew your mind by the word of God. That's what we've got to do. And, and so we need the word of God. So I want to just make some practical suggestions about this idea of the quiet time. I, I really believe in the importance of the systematic daily reading of scripture. And if possible, reading through the Bible in a year. I have a reading scheme, Robert Murray McShane. I've been doing it for years. And this, this is it. Just tells you, you know, and I don't even follow the date. I just every day do it. Don't necessarily, I didn't start January the 1st. I started when I felt convicted about reading it. And so and I've done that for years. And I, I find, I, I can't imagine a year going by without Ezekiel. I love Ezekiel. Can you imagine going a whole year without reading Ezekiel? Now, I can imagine a year going by without reading the genealogies in First Chronicles, but, but Ezekiel, I love it. But you see what I'm saying is the word of God. Imagine getting to heaven. And there are people that have never read their Bibles through. Christians who have never read their Bibles through. I know this because I, I mentioned to some of you, I was at a conference, I won't say where, and I was doing a, a seminar on Bible study methods. And I said, well, a good place to start is reading the Bible. How many of you read the Bible through, cover to cover? And they were, these were totally mature Christians, a room, probably 60 people. And I, there, there's hardly one hand of people who had read through the entire Bible. I was in shock, absolutely in a state of shock. These supposedly mature Christians, they had never read through the entire Bible. And the way to do that is to take up a reading scheme, something uh, or schedule like McShane's, and I can give you a help in getting one. But it's a wonderful discipline to get involved with. Uh, I want to quote from George Muir, one of the great heroes of the faith. And this is, this is his words. And by the way, Christian biographies, uh, good Christian biographies, can really be a help and an inspiration to living a disciplined life. Like We all like heroes, right? And so the heroes of the faith can really help us. We can say, Lord, I'd like to be like that. Uh, I, I, and so here's George Mueller. This is what he says. He says, the vigor of our Christian life will be in exact proportion to the place held by the Bible in our life and thoughts. I solemnly state this from the experience of 54 years. The first three years after conversion, I neglected the word of God since I began to search it diligently, the blessing has been wonderful. I have read the Bible through 100 times and always with increasing delight. Each time it seems like a new book to me. Great has been the blessing from consecutive, diligent, daily study. I look upon it as a day lost when I have not had a good time over the word of God. Now, just let me just say that again. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But he says, I, this is my, my testimony after 54 years. He says, the first three years, I neglected the word of God in his Christian life. And now he's saying, I've read through it a hundred times. Now, do the math. What does that tell you? After he finally got serious about reading the word of God, he read through it twice a year. For the next 50, 50, 40, whatever years, 50 years. Isn't that amazing? And we wonder, why did this man have such faith to feed all these orphans and all the rest of it? Well, I'll tell you how he has so much faith, because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. This man's saturated with the word of God. And I, you know, I was talking to my grandkids, I found it so interesting. I love English and I love words, and I'm teaching them English. And so one of the words we came across was confidence. You know what confidence means? Well, fide, sole fide, right? It's faith alone. Confidence means with faith. And let me tell you this. The more you know the God of Scripture, the more confidence you will have in his promises. Your faith will increase. And, and so <clears throat> it's a wonderful thing. And so George Mueller, this great man of faith, uh, how did he become George Mueller, the great man of faith? Well, he, he, he said, I, I look on a day lost, but I've not had a good time over the word of God. I read it with increasing delight. 
And so we need to pray for this uh, ourselves, that we would be, become people of the book. Pray the Holy Spirit would help you to understand what you read. That's the wonderful thing about the scriptures. It's, it's, it's not just like any other book. You couldn't read another book 100 times and, and it'd be like a new book to you every time. Imagine reading a textbook 100 times. I mean, you'd know it well, but it wouldn't really do you much good. But this is a living, dynamic word of God. That's why every time you read it, so something fresh jumps off the page at you because it's living, it's dynamic. And here's the interesting thing is that we can ask the author to help us understand it because he lives within us. Like one of the things that the Spirit of God has been given is to lead us into all truth. Isn't that wonderful? So I remember when I was doing Shakespeare in school, and there'd be times I'd be reading, I'm thinking, I'd love to ask the guy what he meant by this statement, because it makes no sense to me whatsoever. But I've never been able to talk to Shakespeare and say, tell me what you meant. I can read a passage of the word of God, and I can really pray. I said, Lord, allow your spirit to help me understand this passage, because I'm really struggling. I can't get it in my head, but I want to understand it. And, and it's amazing that something called enlightenment, illumination, the spirit of God turns the lights on and suddenly you see it clearly. It's wonderful. And, and there's no other book like that. So, so we're talking about the disciplined daily reading of the word of God. And as just helpful things. As I read through the Bible each time I read through, I look for different themes. Uh, one year I was just fascinated by the subject of the Holy Spirit. So as I read through the entire Bible, every reference on the Holy Spirit, I underlined it. I meditated on it. I wanted to understand better the Holy Spirit from the entire counsel of God. The other time I was going through, I wanted to understand holiness. So every word in scripture that had to do with holiness, sanctification, uh, holy living, I paid attention to it because that was the theme that I went through that time. Another time I've gone through, I've been thinking of the love of God, uh, fear of God. I did it when I'm going through on the fear of God. And it just kind of keeps it fresh and living. You're looking for some theme as you go through, but it can be really helpful. I'm just giving suggestions of how we can do a better job of of getting more out of the word of God. Now, I want to talk about personal Bible study now. 2 Timothy 2.15 a verse we know well. Uh, again, we're just talking about these, these important disciplines. But 2 Timothy 2.15, uh, it says this. Um, that's 1 Timothy. Nevertheless, she shall be saved in childbearing, which is not the verse I was looking for. 2.15, there we go. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, the word study there uh, in verse six, uh, 15 uh, it literally means strive diligently to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so the idea is this, make every effort. And so we were to really make effort to become, every one of us, every believer, a Bible scholar. Okay. We're not looking, we're done with the idea of clergy, right? We, that's gone, right? No clergy, laity distinction. Every believer is a priest. Every believer is to be a Bible student. And so how do we do that? How do we become that Bible student? Uh, how do we, where do we begin? Well, one thing we can say is there, there are wonderful resources available today on the internet, you know, kind of Bible study tools that are available, Bible study programs, software, all the rest of it. You see, if we're really going to become a skilled craftsman, what you need is to invest in the right tools. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of interesting that uh, somebody who's a good mechanic, what they'll tell you is, you just need the right tool. Some places are really hard to get to, but there are tools that can help you to get to that place and get it out easy. And if you've got the right tool, it just makes it easy. Well, we've got all the right tools. We've never been blessed with so many tools today. In fact, if I, if I could say this, it's never been easier to be a Bible student today because of technology. It's never been harder to be a Bible student than today because of technology. 
Now, I'm not contradicting myself. Sounds like some of the verses in the book of Proverbs, doesn't it? Where it almost seems like it. I'm not contradicting. What I'm saying is this. We've got tremendous resources available that speed up the process. Uh, in the old time, they wanted to look up how a verse was used. They had to get concordance out and then a Greek concordance. And it, now you just one click and you're there. You've got it all before you, you know, using uh, some of the, the, the software tools that are out there. On the other hand, that same technology is what sucks us in and distracts us away from the word of God. So it's never been easier, never been harder. And it really comes down to appetite. Do we really want to uh, really know the word of God? And so investing, Bill McDonald, you know, he wrote that commentary, the Believer's Bible commentary. You know, it took him 30 years to go through the whole Bible a few verses at a time. We don't realize that's a huge commitment, isn't it? 30 years of his life, but look at the fruit of it. It's translated into so many different languages, but there was a point that he determined before God that he was going to study every book of the Bible and write comments on it, and he determined to do that 30 years down the pike, he did it. Praise God for that. We're all benefiting from that. So some of the things that are out there, the Blue Letter Bible, uh, eSword or MacSword, if you use the right kind of computer, Logos Bible software. I mean, all of these things are out there. Just so much stuff available. A good study Bible is helpful. A concordance, uh, a Bible dictionary. Bible dictionaries are really helpful because, uh, you know, because we don't live in Bible lands. Some of the uh, the plants, the animals, the the, the culture, the the, uh, the flora and fauna. A Bible dictionary will really help you with those kind of things. Like the, I remember one time I was studying this passage where the Lord cursed the fig tree, and it, it says it wasn't the season for figs. And I thought, well, that sounds really harsh. Like if it's not the season for figs, why did He curse the fig tree? Well, if you look up about the, in a Bible dictionary about the fig tree, you'll find that if a if a tree has leaves. It has figs in the leaves, you know, kind of there. If there's leaves there, there'll be figs there. And so it, 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 there, there would have been, it might not have been, they may not have been in season. They might have not been fully ripe, but you could still eat them, right? It wasn't the season, in other words, it wasn't time for them to be fully ripe. But if there were leaves there, there ought to be figs. And Israel had all the outward religious outward show that there ought to be fruit. And there was no fruit. And so it was just helpful. The Bible dictionary really helped me. Another thing that's very helpful is um, to prepare for the weekly Bible study in your assembly. Even if you're not going <coughs> to speak at it, it doesn't matter. But it will help you concentrate on what's been spoken on if you prepare as if it depended on you. I find that a great thing to do. Like whatever we're studying our Bible study, I'll prepare as if I'm speaking, whether I'm on the schedule or not. I'll try to get ready to, to give that, in case the preaching doesn't show up, I can do it, I'm ready. Now, and it's just, it's giving yourself that discipline. I'm gonna get ready for this. I wanna be ready for it, I wanna be prepared. And when he's giving the Bible study, I'm, I'm absolutely tuned in because I've already studied it myself. And I'm looking, what's he gonna say? How's he gonna approach this? Because I've already done it. And so it's very helpful to do that. The reason, where I get that idea from, um, some of you will have at some point been to the Florida Men's Bible Study. Any of you been to the Florida Men's Bible Study? Maybe some of you have. There, there was a guy called Bernard Osborne who used to take that Bible study. He was a Welshman. And uh, I remember I, I only been to two of them. And one was on the book of Leviticus. <laughs> And Bernard Osborne had a tiny Bible. I don't even know how he saw the Bible, never mind the text. No notes. And for a whole week, he unfolded the richness of the book of Leviticus. It was absolutely wonderful. And everybody that's there, a lot of preachers were there. They all said, wow, you know, how did, how did you get that way? And, and his answer was, our art assembly had a midweek Bible study. And he said, I prepared for it because the men asked me to prepare because it was during the war years and, and some of them would be missing on air raid duty or whatever. And so they asked me to prepare as if it would depend on me. And he said, I did that and I got into that habit and I never stopped. He, all those years, he had a full-time job. He was the head of the education in Wales, uh, actually the head of the entire education system in Wales. So very, uh, very dominant, prominent career. And yet... Uh, 
Um, he had a tremendous knowledge of the word of God. And it was the, di the discipline preparing for the midweek study as if it would depend on him. Another just helpful tips that I find really have been a big help to me, find a place where you can study and leave your stuff. Like talk to your guys, if you study, talk to your wife. Just have a little corner of the house where you can lay your books out and then just leave them there. So you're not having to go through this process all the time. And, and, and then you can just get up and, and you, know, you never get hours to do, the, to do this. So you've got to have little snatches. And, and so that's how you do it. You get 10 minutes, okay. I'm not going to surf the internet and look at nothingness. I'm just going to go back and study it. So but when I was, uh, probably one of the busiest times in my life, I was a student at New Tribes uh, Missionary Training School in Wisconsin. And uh, we had work detail, we had classes, we had papers to write, and we had a new baby. So like, this is busy, busy time of life. But I wanted to study the Book of Romans. So I get up, uh, I set my alarm, I get up at five o'clock each day, and I'd spend maybe 20 minutes just studying the Book of Romans. Sometimes I just got one verse done. Other days, I got three or four verses done. And my wife allowed me a little corner where I could leave things out. And by the time we finished uh, the two-year course, I finished the Book of Romans, and I was ready to go. Gone through, I, I started Romans because Warren Wiersbe said on the radio, if you're not right on Romans, you're not right. And I thought, well, I want to be right. So I thought, well, Romans is a good place to begin. But the idea is this, that it wasn't like nobody ever has hours to study the Word of God. You have to make the most of small snatches of time. And doing that, you can really grasp a lot of things. Uh, keep good notes of what you've studied. Use a filing system. I have a filing cabinet with all my studies. Uh, Genesis to Revelation and, and the top two drawers and the bottom two drawers are, are topical, you know, so uh, biblical topics. Uh, how do I know the Bible is true? Uh, creation, evolution, uh, role of women in the church, uh, all of the controversial issues, homosexuality. I've got a filing cabinet full of articles. And so if I need something, I just can go to the file and there it is. You know, it's just the idea. Of, it's it's underlying these things, uh, uh, making sure you you've got the resources and you use them. Another thing in studying the Bible, which is was revolutionary to me. I wish somebody had taught it to me much earlier. But it's just as you read a passage of scripture, pay attention to the repeated words and phrases that the Spirit of God uses. It's not rocket science, but it opens up scripture in a beautiful way. Uh, so, for instance, uh, you're going through 1 Peter, underline every time the word suffering is used. And it's obvious what 1 Peter is about. It's a suffering church because it's repeated over and over and over again. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 11. If you want to understand 1 Corinthians 11, 1 through 16, read through it. And every time it says head, underline it. Every time it says cover, covering, uncover, underline it. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist. It's right there in the text. It tells you what it means by just looking at the key words. It's really revolutionary. And so I just want to encourage us to, to, to do that, to, to pay attention. The hearing of the word of God. Um, we're kind of running out of time here, but I want to just uh, talk a little bit about hearing God's word. There's a tremendous emphasis on paying attention as we listen to the word of God. Remember Revelation 2 and 3 in the letters to the churches? One of the repeated phrases in Revelation 2 and 3, it's, it's in chapter 2, 7, chapter 2, 11, chapter 2, 17, chapter 2, 29, chapter, chapter 3, verse 6, chapter 3, verse 13, chapter 3, verse 22. It says this, he that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the churches. And so it's telling us that there's, there's a... We all have ears. <laughs> There's no question about it. But do we have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying? And so how we listen is really important. And I often say we, we probably need not just a course in homiletics, but a course in listening to messages. Uh, so having the right attitude and posture is essential. Look at the preacher. Now, he might not be the most handsome June on the block, but look at him, right? Pay attention to the preacher. Look at him. 
uh, try to be well-mannered and stifle yawns and looking bored. Because preaching is a two-way street, and the preacher feeds from the audience, and sometimes he feels like he's a bottom feeder. He's not getting much. But, but the idea is to pay attention. Take notes. Uh, even encourage your children to write down words that the preacher repeats. My kids used to do that. They'd make a list of the words that I was, whoever the preacher was, would repeat it, and how many times he said it. Uh, so that's, you know, just that you're paying attention. Uh, in terms of hearing the word of God, come expectantly. Come having prayed for the preacher. Uh, come early to make sure that your children go to the bathroom or whatever so that they're, uh, they're not up and down like yo-yos during the message and distracting others. Uh, we said take notes. Uh, it, it's interesting, um, the, the several places where I used to preach and <laughs> To give you an example, in, in, in Leeds in England, there was uh, there were several assemblies in that area, and uh, I was talking to another preacher, and I said, who preaches preaches in the same assemblies, I said, I said to him, which is your favorite assembly to preach at? Oh, he said, that's easy, Herald's Gospel Hall. I said, that's interesting, that's my favorite place to preach. Why is it your favorite place to preach? He said, Margaret Dewhurst. I said, that's why I like preaching there too. Margaret Dewhurst. This sister, she sits there, she stares at you the whole time. As you're quoting scripture, she's mouthing it with you, like she's saying, you know, she's in agreement. And, and you just talk to her. You don't talk to anybody. You ignore everybody else in the audience. You preach to her because she is, she is loving the word of God. And afterwards, she'll come up and have some positive thing to say. And, and I, I, I think that she was the most valuable brother in that whole assembly in that she elevated the preaching of the word of God because she has such a love for scripture. It was obvious. She's nodding, she's agreeing, she's mouthing her amens quietly, not out loud, but she just is so engaged and it was a delight to preach there. So hearing the word of God, uh, even after the message is over, this is almost over, but don't devolve into irrelevant small talk. I remember one time a, a gospel message that was given in the assembly we were in in Ireland. Powerful gospel message. And it was there was a, an atmosphere of solemnity after the message. It was clearly God. But one guy got up and he just made some little joke. And the whole atmosphere was killed. It was a terrible thing. But we've been talking about heaven and hell, about eternity, about the most solemn thing that somebody gets up and gives some trivial joke and it just kills it. And so it, we, we pause and meditate on what you've heard. Never close your Bible until the preacher has closed his. I'm just, these are just good manners, folks. I'm just talk, teaching how to be mannerly Christians, right? We need a course in good manners. Pray about what you just heard. And here's the most important thing, obeying the word of God. Look with me at Ezra, please. Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10. Ezra chapter 7, verse 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Isn't that a wonderful attitude towards the word of God? He had prepared his heart. So when he came to the word of God, he came with a heart that was prepared. I want to hear from you, God. I want to know what your law says. And then not only do I want to know it, just so I've got this intellectual knowledge, I actually want to do it. Is there any wonder God blessed Ezra? Oh, if we had more Ezra's today, we'd have a different atmosphere in the church. And you see, if it's just a case of accumulating knowledge, and all of this that we're talking about, it's not about knowledge, because knowledge puffs up, 1 Corinthians 8, 1. It's about transformation. It's about allowing the word of God to change us. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. James says that, you know, if you go to a mirror and you see that there's a huge pimple on the edge of your nose that just needs a little bit of attention. Now, this is a paraphrase, right? But you get the idea. 
and you walk away and don't do anything, what good is it? You said you go to the mirror, you see what's wrong, and you put it right. You make adjustments. See, that's where the blessing comes. So, like last night, we talked about prayer. Was your prayer life any different this morning? Maybe you already have a marvelous prayer life. But was there any tweaks that you made because of what you heard? See, we should be asking ourselves. In fact, you know, instead of taking notes, maybe we should do a to-do list. As you're listening, not I've got to do this, this, and this. But what do I need to do with what I'm hearing? Is there any action that I need to take in the Word of God? D.L. Moody wrote in the cover of his Bible, this book will keep me from sin, and sin will keep me from this book. Psalm 119, we began that way, a good place to end, really. But in Psalm 119, the psalmist wrote 176 things that impressed him about the Word of God. 176 verses about how delighted he was with the word of God, how much he loved the word, of God, how much he wanted to grow in the word of God. I wonder if we could, if we were ever given an assignment to do that, could we do that? You see, we're talking about a disciplined Christian life, the importance of discipline. And prayer requires discipline, but Bible study requires discipline. There was a, a famous preacher, uh, Harold Singer, and uh, a lady came up to him after he had preached, and she said this, I would give the world to know the Bible like you do. And he looked at her and he says, ma'am, that's what it cost me. I would give the world to know the Bible like you. That's exactly what it cost me. He shut off the world so he could devote himself to the word of God. And if we're going to have Harold Sinjins in our generation, we're going to have to have men and women who shut off the distractions of the word of God and devote themselves to the study and obedience to the word of God. May God help us in these things. Let's pray. Our Father, we're so thankful that you have provided such great resources for us. We think of the word of God, we think of men like William Tyndale, who literally laid down his life so that we, the common man, so to speak, could have the Bible in our own language. Oh God, we, we're so indebted to men that have gone before, that have labored over translating the scriptures into our language. And here we are, we're blessed, we have such a goodly heritage, and yet, Father, we confess to thee that it's so easy for us to be distracted and to feed on the junk food of the world and even allow our minds to be corrupted by the philosophies of the world because we're not disciplined about being in thy precious word. Lord, make us again the people of the book. Make us again people that not only know our Bibles, but like Ezra, prepare our hearts to not only know what the Word of God says, but to obey it. But help us to be a people that are thoroughly biblical in every way, and will give thee all the glory and all the praise in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat>
just the ladies are just finishing up with the chili and getting ready. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing calls for songs of loudest praise. Come thou fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, all for songs of life is praise. Teach me some glory and some some by faith, some some by it's his name by fixed upon Name of God, hitherto thy love has blessed me, thou hast brought me to this place, and I know thy love will bring me he to rescue me from danger, love me with his precious blood, to raise our great identity. They Take and seal it, seal it for the night. Maybe we'll just ask blessing on the food, and I I'll trust they'll be ready when we dive out there. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we're able to spend time in your precious word, and we're thankful that it, it speaks of the Lord Jesus and it tells us how the Lord Jesus wants us to think, how he wants us to act, and how he wants us to live. And so now we would just, as a blessing on the time, um, as we go and enjoy the fellowship and the food, we ask that blessing on it and the meeting to follow and all this. We ask in the precious name of thy dear son. Amen. Thank you.